You know I love to talk that talk. Been like that so, since I could. Thank you for joining me, Miss Queen. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. So, the <laughs> hope laughing at me. Make me laugh. So the way I like to start, I want to say thank you for joining me for Care Dangerous Conversation. And um, the first thing I like to do is give you your flowers. So just sit back for a second, and then <laughs> I, I love you, Quita. I love now, you too. <laughs> not only do I like, I told Sherry Shepherd, uh, you and her got something in common. You have a beautiful smile. Thank you. I, I absolutely love your smile. You're welcome. And uh, that's the first thing I noticed when I met you is your smile. Uh, you're just a warm person. And outside of that. I want to thank you for uh, serving our community by uplifting our children. I know it's not easy being an educator. Um, so, you know, a lot of people who love the children. I know you got to have part I time. love the children. <laughs> I know you, you got to love the children to, you know, be an educator. Yeah. Uh, we know that. So I just want to say thank you for doing the things you do for the community to give back and having a good heart. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. So if you could just introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay. I am Shaquita Foster. I am an educator um, in the inner city of Atlanta. I'm also a program um, specialist. I'm particularly working with the youth. Um, I also call myself a community resource specialist as well because I work in the community prior to working in education for a number of years. And one of my jobs was to use the resources that's in the community, the businesses, different stakeholders, and make sure that they're connected to the youth. And so made a lot of connections doing that. And when you make a lot of connections, it's not just about you making the connections, it's about you opening up opportunities for the youth so that they have more, you know, experiences and exposure. So that's about what I do. I have a passion for youth, particularly teenagers. Um, I love all the babies, but I connect mm -hmm. with teenagers. You know, God, I would say God gave me that gift. And, um, you know, I work with at-risk youth at my school and in the community. But that's about, that's a, that's a good wrap-up of who I am and that what I do. Perfect. That was perfect. What is it exactly about teenagers that touch you and your heart to impact in their life? I don't know. I think um, my life experiences, for some reason, I have a connection with them. Like, I'm, I, I have no problem with speaking to anybody. I see, I hope, you know, sometimes in the streets and times we live in, you can speak to somebody's child and you might get something back you don't want. But I'm never scared to speak to our youth. Um, also, I think the things that I went through in my life early on, I'm able to relate with a lot of the kids that I work with in the community and at my school. And so in terms of, letting them understand that, you know, this is where you are now, but this is where you can be. And there's no limits to what you can do. And so I think that's a, a, a reason why I actually work with the teenagers because I think they understand that and they could see it. They could measure their progress. That's awesome that you do that, you know, because um, children need someone to talk to. And, you know, sometimes they don't have the kind of home life where they maybe feel comfortable talking to their parents. You never know what a child is going through. And they might not have parents in the home to talk to. And so, you know, they need a trusted adult that they could speak to and get good information from. Are there resources outside of, like we said, the home that children can look into when they are needing someone to express their emotions to? Um, for sure, especially like in the school, you have your counselors, and then some schools actually have um, contracted psychiatrists that come into the school with the parents' permission that could, you know, provide other resources or programs for them. And then you have different nonprofit organizations who are in the community who offer um, additional program implementation, like healthy relationships, um, how to become a more askable teen, or, you know, how to become more employable. So there are other resources available, but I will note that there's not as many as there used to be, because our kids need resources, but they also need money. And so I remember when I was a teenager, that's why I love programming, because programming changed my life. It gave me so many opportunities. 
Um, but there's not a lot of programming for kids to even learn about financial uh, stability or, you know, fi have like financial knowledge or even give them the opportunity to learn, get exposed, have experience, but also build an incentive or for financial gain. There's not a lot of resources, programs like that, especially for older teens. Uh, as a teacher, I'm always interested to know because <laughs> I feel like parents right now in this climate are learning things about their children they probably didn't know because they have been stuck with them for so long. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> as a teacher, and they're they're actually saying, oh my God, thank the teachers now. Even the people that didn't say it before, they're like, oh, okay, I see what they was talking about when they said your child was acting up a little bit. I I I see what they were going through. Maybe yeah, I should this is your child. Teacher. <laughs> I would like to know as a teacher, what's the what's a part of, of the teenagers or the children? What's a part of them that you feel like you know about a little bit more? Maybe a little bit more. What's a part of them you know that maybe the parents miss at home? Maybe they can gain from your school time them at school. A lot of our kids feel like they're not heard. Okay. Even if what they're saying could be far left and absolutely wrong, we have to listen to our kids. Just as much as, you know, they're learning from us, we can also learn from them. And so a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of problems come because a lot of our kids feel like they're not being heard at home. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I think I would, what I was saying is, where's that quote I wrote down? Because it's a quote that I know everybody heard from their mama, their grandma, their auntie, is that where is it? Kids are to be seen, not to be heard. <laughs> exactly, and that's you know, the problem. You know, because if you so listen you're saying to that your, that's something that we shouldn't go by uh, no. you anymore. Need to, you need to listen to your kids because there is something there, and it it opens up the opportunity for you to guide and shape them, and also educate them, especially if it's misinformation that they're trying to speak to you. You I always, when I was in the field, because I was a health educator prior to going into education, a part of also the um, program that I ran. But you are your primary child educator. You are your, you are the primary health educator. You are the primary educator. You are the primary doctor. As the parent, your children want to hear from you. And they mm -hmm. want you to listen to them. It just opens up um, dialogue. And it allows you to become a more askable parent, you know, and they become more comfortable with bringing things to you. And again, you teach your children. Look, you know what? I was going to go on to my next thing I want to talk about, but somebody in the comments said a great question that I want to throw at you or kick mm -hmm. at you. What has most significantly, significantly changed about the school system or kids in general from your teenage age you now like how has it changed from you okay so in all transparency out in january it'll be five years for me teaching okay, okay. i or, like i said prior to teaching health educator assistant program director so i'm not gonna act like i know everything that was going on in the school system but a little more respect was given when i was in school okay. that's the first thing and just not respecting the teachers, but also how we carried ourselves. I know mm -hmm. when I was in school, a lot of people came from communities that were poverty stricken, but we just carried ourselves a little different, you know, in terms of what we looked like, how we talked with each other, how we talked to our teachers, um, how we cared about our grades. And I'm not saying the kids these days don't care. It's just a little different. You know what? In uh, elementary school, and I'm not that old. I always <clears throat> remind people that. Right, we young. <laughs> um, in, in elementary school, I got paddled with a wooden paddle. Uh, can you imagine a teacher doing that today? Have you seen the videos? Like, kids are oh, fighting they, they, adults. Oh, and, and, the, and, you know, I love parents. But I tell my kids, just like I tell my parents when I used to do my parent workshops, we create the kids that we see now. Yes. They don't come out bad. <laughs> they don't come out messed up. You know, there might be some development to disability or something like that, but in terms of the kid that you see every day on the hall that's causing havoc, 
that child was made that way from some type of experience that he or she has had. Also, structure. When you talk about getting paddled, there was some repercussions for cutting up. There was right. some structures in place, you know, um, in order to understand that a schoolhouse is a schoolhouse. You came here to learn, you know, and to socialize and make good decisions and make friends, but ultimately you're here to learn and to make sure, you know, for me, education was my way out. And so, you know, that's that's the goal. But kids need structure from you know, elementary to middle school. You know, I got that whooping at school, but I'll be fine. By my teacher, like, I I don't know if I'm giving her name out, but uh, she had those. Shout that name out, sister. Shout <laughs> that name out. <laughs> she had those wooden sticks, and it was a red stick. I'll never forget. You better hold your hand now. You be tapped on your hand with the wooden stick. Oh, my goodness. Look, I don't think I deserve my paddling, and but, but I tell you, if they brought it back, I wouldn't be mad because you're I right. I see coming back. I've heard horror stories of elementary school kids cutting up with the teacher real bad. Well, I don't think it's coming back either, but I'm saying if it did come back, I wouldn't be opposed to it just because it's <laughs> penalty, some kind of thing to be a surprise, maybe, yeah. you know, something, who knows. Okay, so another topic that I, I feel like a lot of parents are crazy about is the virtual learning. Mm. Because a lot of them feel like they're getting a lot of work from the teacher, you know, they're complaining, and try to figure it out. Uh, so they feeling like they're the teacher now. Uh, do you have any advice to parents on how they can handle the virtual learning so that the kids can get both from it? My suggestion would be first, take a breather. <sighs> take a breather. That's the first thing. Okay. My second thing would be to um, ask the parents you know, to contact the school, you know, like in turn, and, and depending on where you are, a lot of information is coming down from the district. So legit, if you call the school, you call a teacher, some of us have no information because again, we're living in unprecedented times. This yeah. is new for everybody. So I would say talk to the school, but when you talk to the school or talk to the district, operate with compassion. Yeah, that's for parents, and that's the same thing with we're asking our teachers and people in our building. Compassion over com compassion, then compliance. And so, in terms of understanding that this is new for everyone, I think getting the most information you can get from the school when what school when school is starting, what is going to look like, what do your children need, and what's going to be most important for parents to be honest because mm. we really do want to make sure the kids have the resources they need in terms of technology um now in terms of company providing technology like comcast or whatever your provider is the school really has no bearing on that but i'm quite mm -hmm. sure there's going to be some organizations that are going to support the efforts to getting every student prepared virtually um for school so it's going to be important that parents connect with the school and connect with the district to see what resources are available and just operate in compassion and be patient because again it's going to be trial and error for a mm -hmm. lot of us you know, that's why I keep saying operate out of compassion, but we're going to try, we're going to stay in compliance because our kids yeah. still have to get a quality education. Yes, they do. And it's going to look different. Now, we had a lot of stories too um, here. Kids, high school kids, they were like, all of this work, what is going on? Because again, you're taking an in-class 12, 13 standards that we mm. have to cover within a year or even if you had eight within that last semester of school we left and you're trying to cover everything and a lot of the standards are tied to these standardized tests and so a lot of teachers were like I have to get this done I have to get this done and, and it was a lot of work and so it is my hope um, that teachers and schools and districts are looking at the standards and seeing what's most important and looking at what's aligned with testing if we're going to have testing what's most important was to prioritize and tackle that first i know my district especially the department i work in we've already started doing that because we know realistically 
it's going to be hard to do what we used to do in the classroom and transfer it online. But we have to make sure we cover the things that are most important. Wow, that was really good information right there. Yep. So I just, I think, I, I think people, I would say, I think parents, um, if you can keep a positive mindset around this virtual thing, because it's not always, it, I don't think it's all bad because I will mm -hmm. say some students who had trouble um, in a community setting in the classroom, some of those kids excelled those last couple months during mm -hmm. school because a lot, some kids are okay to work alone, you know? Um, you just have to look at what the opportunities are and what the benefits will be. One thing I will say is I'm not sure if this has already been set in stone, but a lot of colleges for your seniors that are, you know, going to be seniors this year, a lot of especially HBCUs are going off your GPA. And so this allowed kids to focus on the quality of work they're turning in and to receive the grade that they deserve without worrying about testing over their head. And it levels the playing field because yeah. you can go to any school you want to. That's awesome. I didn't like test. taking tests. I didn't like no, tests at no. I didn't either. But you have to do what you have to do. And 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 unfortunately, there's a test throughout throughout life, regardless. You know what I mean? But I think this could be a great opportunity if parents and students take advantage of it. But again, it requires you to have a lot of information on the front end so you don't feel like you're playing catch up or something was left out. And a lot of that's going to be um, initiated by the parent. So I will say during this virtual time, parents are going to have to step up. And unfortunately, I do know that some kids will suffer and some kids may even fall through the cracks. But when you got great teachers and you have a great administrator staff, then they try not to let that happen because you're calling every kid. Some people are showing up at people's homes. You know, it's, it really takes a village, especially doing what we're doing now virtually. That's what I wanted to know from you was like, how active uh, does a parent need to be in a kid's social and school life these days with Very. social media going on and everything, Every all the information, good or bad, it's just at their fingertips. Very. And you know what? What, what gets me all the time, sometimes I hear parents like, uh, they want their kids talking about certain things or knowing certain things, right? But they have devices. And if you don't have locks on those devices, you'll be surprised what your kids already know and what they've already been exposed to. Yeah. And so um, I think it's very important for parents to be active in their student lives, especially students who live in poverty-stricken areas, because there are a lot of resources, I will say, at Title I schools. But our parents, a lot of them are busy because they're working two, three jobs trying to make ends meet. So you don't see them at the school, but that does not mean that they're not interested in their child's life. That does not mean that they don't care about their child's um, academic progress. They're just trying to make ends meet. And so um, the parents who you see all the time, who's super active, those kids get more because again, the parents are there advocating for them. So yeah. parents actually operate as your child advocate. And if you're not gonna um if you're not gonna be present to do that, then some parents have actually taught their kids how to advocate for themselves. And that's based on communication skills. So it is important that they're active. I'm glad you said that. Um now, the kids may be trying to take advantage of the parents a little bit. And I don't have a kid. Let's be clear. I have a cat, and yes, he runs my life. So if I had a kid, they probably would get to do whatever they yeah. want. <laughs> anyway, so I just want to know, I feel like if I did have a child, that during the school year when they're doing virtual learning, I know some places are going back to school and it's the parent's choice. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the people who opt to stay at home with their kids – they should keep the same schedule they would if their child was going into school. Because I feel like some of the kids are taking advantage by staying up late at night. You oh, know, for sure. doing work at night. I, in my mind, I would say still go to bed on time, wake up on school time, and go through that work and be done at a proper time. What do you think as a teacher is the best way to tackle that? Um, I'm going to go back to saying structure, structure is important. Okay. And so, especially for elementary and middle school kids, 
you know, um, high school too, because a lot of these kids are working on graveyard shift right now. They're up all night and they're sleeping all day and school is right around the corner. And so parents need to start now breaking that cycle, putting some times in place to make sure that they are going to bed early, getting up early enough to make sure that they have breakfast because we're not at the schoolhouse, something so mm -hmm. that, you know, they're fueling their body. Now, I'm not sure what people's schedules going to look like, but I, I don't foresee the schedule being exactly like it was when we were, we were in school, but something very close to it. Um, the last three weeks of school at the end of the semester, I had my niece here and she was in elementary. She's in elementary school and her school started at 10. So from 10 to about 12 every day, she had her classes and she had different classes on each day. Some class will repeat, but that was her schedule. And now, to be honest, that's mm -hmm. probably all she could handle because of the attention span and they're sitting there and there's no one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I think that's going to be a place where we find a deficit with our kids for several reasons. Um, in terms of, you know, our kids just keeping it 100. A lot of our kids are way below reading level. Like, yes. even in high school, I guess high school kids that are in 10th grade but they have an eighth grade reading level or even low. And so it is our job. It's okay because we get the kids where, we, where they are and we elevate them. You know, that's, that's what we're here to do, to do our, try our best to do that. Um, but that one-on-one -on -one interaction, especially elementary school, middle school, and even high school is very important with assisting the kid to elevate their academic levels. You know, I was I was researching about that because you and I had talked about how important vocabulary is, and I told you about how I needed to grow my vocabulary, and that's really something that's lacking in our black children. And when I did my research, I found that a lot of successful people um, are bilingual, or what is it called when you know more than two languages? Uh, bilingual. I think it's. I think after after you learn a couple more or something else, I think it starts with an M. Maybe You're a multilinguist. <laughs> maybe so. Maybe that's it there. Um, but I heard that those people ha have a better chance of being successful. I feel like a lot of times, you know, we don't learn about that second language. And well, when I was in school, it didn't happen until I was in middle school. I know some schools offer it earlier now, but I just want to point out to parents: you have the opportunity to teach your child a second language. Take that opportunity. You're expanding their mind. You don't know how many opportunities you're opening them up to. Do you agree with that, Ms. Quinn? I do. I, I agree 110%. Language and words are a big deal for our community because while other cultures from the get-go, we had this conversation, um, yeah. not only are they they're speaking to their kids fluently, mm. Um they're also giving them experiences while they're doing it. And a lot of those words are positive words. And so when it comes to our kids, first words they know, some of us is, no, stop, sit down, shut up, shut up, be quiet. You know, and those are all negative words. And those are small words, you know, opposed to, you know, when we go to the store, what our parents tell us when we go in the store. Don't touch nothing. I'm and not yeah. uh, okay. Opposed to going, you know, and us, <laughs> I experienced that too. Okay, allowing us to explore, like, hey, this is an apricot. Can you spell apricot? Like, hey, what is this? Oh, this is some um, um, linguine. Like, just exploring yes. as small as the grocery store, exploring words and allowing them to touch and see and repeat. But a lot of times our kids get very low level words, they're negative words. And so when we talk about language and building um, our vocabulary, sometimes for our kids it's hard. And then we have a lot of twang and slang. And, you know, even me. Are you talking here, about me? Are you talking about my slang? I have to. talking about my slang. I have to consciously, consciously, like, slow my slur down because you will hear 
the Atlanta Mechanicsville come out quickly. And there's nothing really wrong with that. You know, we've been told for so long that our natural dialect and slang is wrong, but it's not. It's what we need to do with it to elevate it, you know? So vocabulary is important. You know what my mom used to do? And people always say, Kara, you have the gift of talking to so many people and connecting with them. And I think one of those reasons is because of my mother. And she loved to toot her horn. I mean, oops. I mean, well, the point I want to make, I'm just joking. Mama, if you are, I'm just joking. The point that I'm trying to make is, you know, uh, if you have more than one child and they're, and they're, and they're at a certain age, get them to communicate. Get them to debate about uh, world events. You know, it's fun. It's you important. Dad, the kid talk about things around the table. You eat dinner and talk. Let's go back to having family dinner. And I know people are gonna say, "Well, Mama come home this time, Daddy come home this time," or you got one parent that's working all the time. But whoever's in the house, even if you gotta sit around a TV, sit around the TV, watch your favorite show, and eat because you're gonna communicate. You're gonna laugh. Just right. get time to connect. Yes, even if it's not children. I agree. Even if it's not family dinner, it's just family time. Like, yeah. communicate. Use words, you know. Check out how each other feel. And, you know, when you're talking with people, then, depending on what the reaction is, you know how to respond. And so, a lot of kids don't get that interaction. And I'm going to go back to language in a minute. That's but another funny. thing that we're going to miss during this virtual time that social interaction, which is so yeah. important with building social skills because a lot of our kids will be like, I don't want to work with nobody. I don't want to work in a group. And I have to break it all the way down to tell me one job that one person works by themselves. And if you can let me know, then I'll let you work by yourself. But everybody requires somebody in the team. And so in terms of not working with people, it's not an option. And so understanding how to communicate effectively, working groups, collaborate is really, really important. Yeah, you say a uh, mouthful because a person like me, every time you go get a new job, what do they ask you? Are you good at working in groups? And teams. I hope they're not watching. I'm good at working in groups, but I do not like working in groups. And that's completely fine. But again, you can do it. You can you, you got to do it. You we have to build those skills up to make sure that in the event that you are working in a group, you're thriving. You know, the group is successful. I know you will agree, but I feel that it's very important to let kids know it's going to be a lot of things you don't want to do, but the world is going to say you have to do them. So I may not prefer to work in a group, but I have to know how to do it. Exactly. I have to know how to do it well. And like you said, there's so many jobs where you're going to have to do that at some point, even if you don't do it all the time. All the time, exactly. I want to go back and mention something when you said something about learning a second language. I yes, appreciate it so hard with my kids because the United States is not an English-speaking country anymore. I mean, we are, but in terms of the individuals that are here in multi-language, um, link people who speak multi multiple languages, and operating businesses, and so on and so forth. We have to be able to communicate and elevate. And I think as a community, um, the Black community, that's where we we fall short because we don't push learning different languages. We are only focused on English, and you know they tell us we can't do that really well. So sometimes our kids are scared or they already feel defeated with trying to learn another language um, but I would tell parents from the beginning teach your child another language Spanish French it doesn't matter because in order for kids to be employable I would say within the next couple of years they're gonna have to speak another language and more than likely Spanish you know starting with Spanish so again it is important for your kids to learn a second language I'm gonna push and adults it. now as well. I'm gonna push it a little step further. I think it's important to so the kids can grasp grab on something to learn a new language and culture. So if you're studying a certain language, try to learn about the culture. Uh, you know, research it because that's how you begin to love what you're learning. And 
your kids are old enough, the parents don't have to, they can take off the training wheels. There are plenty of resources online that parents can tap into and show their kids or the kids know. They don't, they, like you said, they looking at all kinds of stuff on the phone. So they don't, don't let them fool you, parents. They, they, they know the apps to go to. I'm just going to keep it 100 with you. They already oh, they, they know what they what know is that. The and they need to hop on Duolingo. That's what they need to hop on. Okay. And I, and I was going to say, I, I had started learning a second language during quarantine. And this is the perfect time. Now, I had just a couple of sessions. But I have to say, when I took a Uber to my doctor's appointment, it was an African man in there. And I was so happy. I didn't think much. But I was just so proud of myself that I was able to say hello to him, you know, goodbye, how you doing? I told him what my name was in French. And okay. Yes. So, bonjour, J. Mappel, Cara. Bonjour, J. Mappel, Denise. Because when I was in, uh, long story short, when I was in uh, high school, yes. I was gone, rest her soul, mm -hmm. uh, she told me my name can be Shaquita in French. So, minus. Jennifer Denise. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Yeah, I took French, and I'm like, I could, I could hear some words, and I remember some stuff, but I wish I would have took it seriously myself. But you know, it's never too late to learn at all. And you know, sometimes, like when you said before, that sometimes the kids feel like, well, I don't even know English that well. My grammar's not that great. But you will be surprised, just like me. I know I have, you know, ways to go with my vocabulary, and I'm still growing. With that, but when I started uh, looking into French, I fell in love with it. It's not just because people think the language is beautiful; it's just something about it I connected with. Telling me learn Spanish, learn Spanish, and at one point I did want to learn Spanish, but I just didn't have any interest in learning Spanish at this point. But for some reason, the French just connected with me. That's and good, though. I even know some celebrities who are French that I have a crush on. Two guys. <laughs> you know. The the word. Shout out to the last twins. Hey, boo. <laughs> Boos. And so I'm getting to learn the culture. And I even watched a movie with in French. So it's like so many things you can do to make that learning fun. I just want to throw that out there. I agree. I agree. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask people in the comments if you have any questions for Quita, uh, go ahead and type them up. And Quita, if you have anything you want to talk about, you want to talk about your other things you do in the community. Time now before we wrap up. Um, let's see if they have any questions. But in terms of what's going on in our community with um, education, I just want everybody to keep a positive outlook. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be all bad. And I tell everybody, health over everything. I can't teach you anything if you're sick. And not just physically sick, but even mentally sick. So we have to make sure that our mental health is, health is well as well as our physical health. And so, again, just operating in compassion and making sure as a parent that you're in compliance because we have to be in compliance as well. And I think when we do that together as a community, that is the school, the teachers, the parents, and the students, we can't lose. But if we're not operating together during this time, it's a possibility that there's going to be some adverse effects of this virtual thing but again we need to work together as a community to make sure our kids don't suffer at the end and i also would encourage parents to this is a good time for we know you're not teachers you know again that's our job you know and, and, and what's interesting i said this before is you know so much has been placed on the schoolhouse care like the teachers are teachers mom social workers you name it, we got to do everything. And so right now, within this climate, it allows for everybody to step up. You say you care about the child. You say you have services for the child. There's resources for this child. And not just this one child, but every child that's in a Title I school. Let's make sure our kids have what they need. But again, it's going to take us to operate as a village and not separately. I love that. We And we... This show, the reason I'm doing it is because I want to show people that are still good hearted people. And I just feel warm inside because, you know, growing up, that's what we had. We could, yes. my mom could leave her door open and have just a glass screen door. Well, you know, just a glass door you could see out. 
and not the big door lock because you felt safe. You know, I could ride my bike until it turned dark and I felt like I was part of a community. Yeah. But not so much now. The kids, uh, the environment is so top. I think as we fell into the ways of uh, we adopted some cultural things that were not ours. And mm -hmm. a lot of that comes from a lot of exposure with, with these phones, <laughs> with yeah. this internet. We're, we're adapting other cultural things that are not ours, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when we do that, we take away a little bit that we have, you know? Like, it's, it's interesting to see the shift in how we operate in terms of community. Like, you just, when I was growing up, you can't have someone running habit on the community and on the kids and the women and children in the community. That just was unacceptable. And everybody knew who that person was or, you know, somebody would take care of that or, hey, go to school. They see you outside of school. You're supposed to be in school. Someone would tell you to go to school or even take you to school. These days, I think people are scared to talk to our kids. We got to And I would say rightfully so. You know, because there are some kids that are, you know, they've been hurt. So hurt people hurt other people. They don't know how to react. They don't know how to respond. But again, it's okay to talk to these kids. It is okay to reach out and just make sure, like I said, as a village that we are okay. And I will also, one other thing I want to say, programming is important. Mm -hmm. When I say programming, I mean quality programs where your children can get the additional help. I was going to tell you that parents, now is the opportunity for you to, you're going to have to invest in your child's education. And it's going to look different. A lot of teachers, a lot of um, mentorship programs, yeah. a lot of um, after school programs, they're adapting to this virtual learning situation as well. Parents are going to have to take advantage of those extra opportunities for tutoring. Yeah, I, I do have some I'm sorry, I do have some more questions. No, I'm going to end with that program and mentorship is important. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the people had a question. I'm trying to figure out what they mean, but maybe you'll get it. They're saying, what do you think about the academic curriculum in school? Um, I think it's, it's necessary. <laughs> But I think it could use a, 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 a redo in terms of not that the standards that they're teaching are old, because again, some of them are old, but they're still relative to the things that the kids need to learn. But in terms of how kids are learning now, you have to make it real for them. You have to bring in real world experiences within the learning and so in terms of one of the things that we have at our school we're a 3e school so our kids get an opportunity to work with companies like delta um arby's uh you name them they're big name companies and basically they come in and they have an issue what we call a case challenge but that case is embedded in every aspect of that child's learning experience from math to social studies to healthcare to business. And so a child gets to say, oh, this is a real world issue that RB is having. How do I take what I'm learning in math because there's math associated with whatever they're asking and apply it? And so I think in terms of looking at the curriculum, what teachers have to do and also what uh, the Department of Education has to do is look at what can be adapted or taught from a real world perspective because it makes it real for the kids. I can tell kids about ecosystems all day long, mm -hmm. but unless I have a person, a scientist come in, or if I have our kids go out and be explore a nice ecosystem, you know, it makes a difference with giving them those real world experiences and opportunities to apply what they've learned. That's excellent. Now, I think we kind of been skirting around this, uh, what we talked about a little bit, but what are exactly some of the greatest challenges that especially our black children are facing today in school? Um, the reading level, I would say the academic gaps, for sure. Just like we talk about uh, the systemic gaps within uh, the financial um, 
difference between blacks and whites, it's the same concept. You see those gaps through throughout every system, especially mm -hmm. in education. Our kids, um, we fare lower on test scores. Uh, our reading levels are lower. And so in terms of one of the biggest challenge is continuing to increase and elevate those reading levels and the ability to keep them actively engaged with the lessons. I think those are going to be the biggest challenge. And I know for high school, attendance, you know, mm -hmm. And for me, I, I want my kids dressed. You know, I did experience some kids, they, they just waking up and I'm in class. That's not going <laughs> to work because if we're doing virtual and this is a long, might be a longer process than we expected. Good point. We have to show up to work ready. You can't yeah. come up in the classroom like that. So I think a lot of the challenges is going to be keeping the kids actively engaged in the lessons, elevating um, the learning disparities in terms of reading and math as much as we can with what we have and um, making sure our kids are present. It's going to be the parent's job to make sure you know your child's schedule so that they are present. Because again, this is, it seems probably, you know, I would say some people are tight about virtual learning, but it doesn't have to be all bad. Okay, do you know anything about this? Because I don't, and I'm going to ask you another viewer question. Mm -hmm. Is K-12 is K-12 still a good format, and could apprenticeships be a good substitute for some later grades? Um, for sure. I would say K-12, through 12, I would say it's still a good format. Um, in terms of apprenticeships, I think, well, I know at my school, we offer um, opportunities for the kids to follow, I'm a healthcare science teacher, um, follow um, different occupations. We also offer what we call um, field experiences where the kids get to actual go into the hospital setting and experience rounds. And so that's a partnership that we have through Grady Memorial Hospital um, and Morehouse School of Medicine. And so Again, I think more schools, depending on what funding looks like, depending on what their setup looks like, it, it actually depends on what the district has in place for the school to say, oh, I can give them these different types of experiences. But I know for sure in my school, our kids have an opportunity, especially um, our students who do, do what we call dual enrollment, where the kids have met majority of the requirements for their core classes, and then they go take classes at um, a college. You know, whether it's a two-year college, four-year college, but those kids have opportunities to do that. And then a lot of kids that finish dual enrollment, they have the opportunity to, to go do work-based learning. So those kids are not on campus because they're working. Now, good, good answer, good question. I have a great question, I think, to kind of just get us to the end of this. Uh <laughs> And I'm going to see how you can answer it because I Let feel like say. this is something important that we must discuss. Um, you know, teachers are great, but every now and then the kids may act up. The kids may have problems at the school and then the parent will become defensive. Right. And they may come to the teacher with a certain attitude that's not really pleasant. Yeah. What advice being a teacher would you give parents? comes to communicating to a teacher when it's in a when a tough situation is going on between the child and the school. You know I'm just point? like for my parents to know that I'm not your enemy. Okay. I want your child to win. Like yeah. I want your child to be great because if your child is doing great things, that's a win for all of us. So that's the first name in terms of we're not enemies. We're on the same team. We're part of that same village. We're trying to raise this child, you know, together. Um, I will also tell your parents there's always another side to the story. Mm -hmm. So as much as you want to defend your child, I think it's important. I'm going to keep using that word compassion, mm -hmm. that you use compassion and listen to both sides of the story because there's always a middle where at the end of the day, we have to come back together to still make sure this child is academically sound and successful. And so it doesn't make sense for us to bump heads, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
children also take that and run with that, right? As well. Right. Right? They use it yeah. to their advantage. And so again, we're on the same team. Um, I will also um tell parents to understand that, you know, it's I'm I just gonna say it, it's a privilege to have your child in a school with teachers that look like them. Mm. It is. And research shows that students who have teachers that look like them are 10 times more likely to be successful and go to college and do great things because we relate on some level culturally. And so it's a privilege to have, have teachers that look like your children to teach them and good, great teachers, you know? Um, don't beat your teachers now. Don't beat your teacher now. And I ask teachers, too, to be honest and work with parents. Because sometimes, you know, teachers will stand their ground, too. Like, I said what I said about your child, and here's the proof. Because kids kid probably didn't be, have done it. But, again, I just want everybody to understand we're on the same team. We're trying to get the same, do the same goal, which is successfully um, make sure your child exit high school, you know? elementary middle and high absolutely i did have a i don't know if you know anything about this i'm trying to read this if i can go back to this uh i may i may not oh here it goes it says somebody asked the uh the current georgia governor wants to drastic drastically reduce funding for dual enrollment how do you feel about this in terms of a missed opportunity for the kids um I would say it's, a, it's, it's, it could be bad. Okay. Our kids are limited on experiences already, especially for our community. You know, a lot of kids are, um, especially high school kids, right? They're still pretty immature. <laughs> but what happens with those kids who have the opportunity to do dual enrollment, you have your friends at school that you kick it with, right? But when you go on that college campus, it's a different feel. It's a different experience. That professor is not like your teacher in the classroom. And so those kids get an opportunity not only to um, pick up the pace and graduate early, because a lot of those kids in dual enrollment, they graduate early. And mm -hmm. some other kids in dual enrollment, depending on how early they got in dual enrollment, some kids will graduate with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is it stops a group of kids from experiencing um, a lot of ed um, educational highs, mm -hmm. especially our black kids. I'm just going to keep it 100. You keep know? it 100, baby. This is what this is for. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's a good good idea. But again, I don't know budgets or anything, but I will say black schools, I'm not going to say black schools, but I'm going to say schools who are in high poverty areas, Title One schools, usually get you know, we have a lot of resources, we're supposed to have a lot of funding, but a lot of it is not there. And so when you tell me you're going to cut more funding, that concerns me. A lot of people always say they wish in school they taught about financial literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been to high school in a long time. Are there programs that are is teaching that now at all? Yes. They, yes. So um, we have we have a business pathway and so within our business pathway there's entrepreneurship there's an entrepreneurship class and so within those classes you teach financial literacy there is a financial literacy piece also other teachers have the opportunity through different um programming um that's available through apps to integrate it um within their lesson so i'm gonna be a hundred all the time with you math classes there's somewhere in there where you can teach a child to be um, financially astute, I would say. Um, I know in my class, when I do careers, we do a whole budget. And it always blows the kid's mind because they'll choose a career and they got this high fashion life that they want to live. And I'm <laughs> like, you got to pay taxes. Like, I'll break it down. You got to pay taxes. You got to have health insurance. You got to have a 401k. I put it all in there. And by the time they do all their calculations, it's like, I got to change my career. <laughs> or get another job because there's plenty of people that work two jobs and so i think it is important for us to teach our kids financial literacy early because again 
when you live in poverty, mm -hmm. you used to a certain type of struggle yes. or you used to gaining finance, financial um, increases a different type of way. And so once you become independent and you're getting, I would say kids say you get in the bag, you got the money. Um, <laughs> How do you make sure that goes a long way? I'm talking about generational wealth, not just for right now. And a lot of a lot of times we don't discuss that. We don't, you know, a kid's not dealing with money until they actually get their first paycheck. A lot of kids don't even understand like how to fill out tax papers. And I know I was one of those when I was I had good jobs when I was in high school, but I had no clue how to fill out a tax paper. And so I made it my business moving forward to make sure that, you know, when I was teaching my, um, doing my programs, that's something that I made sure my kids understood. Because if you're going to get paid, you're going to get money. These are the things that you're going to encounter. And it should not be the first time that, you know, you see these things. Thank God for TurboTax. <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> Easy breezy instructions. I can, yes. I, my, uh, what's the saying? Like, um, if you had something in a book, we won't get it, but I mm -hmm. well, I was able to do my taxes on TurboTax. Shout out to them. Um, <laughs> I want to point out, too, with the financial things, we, those kids are on those phones. On Instagram, even I said, I know a lot of people that are into stocks and have made a lot of money or people are, have an interest now into learning about stocks. You know, on Instagram, it's so good because you can go to these pages and add them the Wall Street Journal, these business uh, magazines, and they have great uh, pictures, memes that they put up, breaking down how stocks work, breaking down how to be uh, more smart when it comes to your finances. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the teaching happens at school, but it happens outside the classroom. It, ha it has to. It, the yeah. schoolhouse can't be the only place where we're teaching our kids because, honestly, we only have so much time in one day, right? Yes. In terms of those apps and Instagram and all the other things, that is absolutely true. Parents have to be more active with the students' um, interactions online. Because what happens is I can have a child that's on the phone all day long, but depends on how, depend on what they're liking and what their algorithms are, and I probably said that word wrong, they're only going to... They're probably going to see only certain things. So if this child likes to see fights all day or like, you know, people who are singing and dancing, that's all that's going to pop up on their timeline. And so it is important for parents and teachers to say, hey, go check this out. Go look at this. Um, one thing I will say that I'm, I'm excited about, what I'm seeing is a lot of young people um, take to Forex trading. Um, I think hey, I said that. Say that, that one before. more time. Forex which okay. is um, currency trading. Um, okay. A lot of like a lot of my students who graduated, they're like, "Oh, we're doing the stock market. We're doing this." So wow. I think you know, it's we're we're getting better with introducing them to different ways to increase their financial knowledge about what's actually out there that they could you know touch or give with their hands in. I keep, saying, I keep saying we're going to end this, but uh, you keep bringing up such good points. So I know I'm going to bring you back mid school here because I think it's important to check in with the teacher. So you're going to be one of the guests that continues, continuously comes back. I appreciate that, Yeah, to, to give parents advice because I think we need it. This show for me is to, to serve the people. That's the only reason I'm doing it. Uh, of course. And I, I think that's great because we need it. We need to talk to each other. Exactly, and I want us to learn each other and get down to the root of the issues, but no politics, just me talking to people who are in the community and helping us uh, uplift each other. I just want to point out another a point real quick, is that I feel like parents at an early age, but if you didn't do it, never too late to do it, help your kids mold and find their passion. You know, give your kids trial and errors where you you introduce them to certain things and you see what they excel at. You see what their heart is. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to do that and that'll keep them out of trouble a lot of times. You know, make sure they have a hobby. Like me, I was in sports. You know, sports taught me how to get along with people I didn't like. You know, it, it taught me how to be a team player. 
It taught me how to fight for something. You had to fight for position. The same thing happens when you go out into the world. You have to fight. And I go back and think about those memories of me. They're some of my fondest memories. I mean, in the days I said, I wish I could just, I don't like, I'm not one of those people who want to be a teenager anymore, but I am one of those people who say, I wish I could go back and play ball. I wish, you know what I mean? Because I would do a lot yeah. of things different. I can see the plays better now. When I got confused about the <laughs> I'm better now. But my whole point is that help your kids find their passions. You'll be amazed at what your kid could be great at. And I agree. I, I agree. I think um, parents should. Thanks, guys. That's the end of part one of Care Dangerous Conversation with educator Shaquita Foster. For part two, head on over to the thread and see part two. You'll see it. It'll say part two. Duh.